All right. Hi, Mary. Hi, Reem. Uh, well, Reem is Ragda today, but it's actually Reem uh, O'Connor. Um, we just had a few Facebook glitches before, but thank you so much for joining me here today on Vonvo.com uh, for a discussion on Syria. Um, I just wanted to go over two quick, um, you know, uh, important rules um, before just jumping into the discussion. Uh, first is just so you know, um, right now this conversation is being recorded. Um, and after the recording is complete, we'll be posting uh, our discussion here today to our YouTube channel. Um, is that okay with both of you? Mm -hmm. That's fine. Great. Um, and then the only other thing just to bring up is that, you know, here at Vonvo, we're all about valuable conversations, um, you know, and so we want our discussions to stay civil. Uh, we don't want there to be any personal attacks on anyone. Um, is, are those ground rules fine with you? Of course. <laughs> All right, great. So uh, let's get started. Unless you invite Assad Kui, then maybe. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I, I might attack. <laughs> so so let's. Uh, well, and it, look, if if someone from you know who is a pro Assad regime comes in, you know, just obviously we're we're all about listening to one another's opinions, and you know. Uh, of course. Re, you of know. Course. Uh, you know what I mean. Uh, so let's let's get started. Um, you know, if we can just start for our viewers, um, Reem, would you mind uh, giving our viewers a quick background um, of yourself, um, and then Mary, we can go to you. Sure. Uh, my name is Reem Connor. Um, I am currently in the United States. I am Syrian. I was born and raised in Syria. I came here um, eight years ago to the States. Um, since you know the uprising in Syria, I've been uh, working with multiple organizations here in the states um, to help, you know, in, in humanitarian aid, uh, you know, financial aid, any sort of aid to help ease the crisis that's happening in Syria. Um, I have tons of family still back home, uh, cousins who were arrested, family member who were tortured and you know been killed. So I think that makes my my passion towards what's happening even more, uh, but just you know the fact that I'm Syrian is happening in Syria, making me want to be involved and, and help in any way I can. Great, and uh, Mary, how about yourself? Uh, I live in Italy. My name is Mary Rizzo. I live in Italy now. Uh, I've been living here for 25 years, but I was born in Chicago, and uh, my activity, professional activity. Is, uh, has nothing to do with, uh, with Syria. Um, I'm a translator and an art restorer, and uh, uh, through these kind of um, professional uh, things that I do, I find that uh, I've always had to have activism as, as the, the more important part, sometimes more important than my family and, uh, and, my, and my work. And I've been a Syria supporter of the Syrian revolution cause only for obviously for two years I, before that my knowledge about Syria was quite limited I was an activist principally for uh, the pan-arab uh, cause um, especially Palestine Palestine uh, liberation I had several blogs some of them I still have uh, I've written extensively on the argument I've been in conferences uh, even uh, conferences in Europe and uh, various various parts, and the, the the Syrian situation really has basically interested me as a as a human rights issue. As anyone would realize that the, the situation is not is not really a war situation in the classic sense of there's a good guy and a bad guy. There's uh, it's a revolution that uh, is basically kind of complicated <laughs> for, for people right. outside to understand. So I've been trying to learn about it and then write about it. Right. And so, you know, just because, you know, here at Volvo, we're all about, you know, our viewers, uh, people who tune in, you know, learning about what's really going on. Obviously, Reem, um, you know, you, you have uh, a bunch of ties back to uh, the country. And, um, you know, you appeared on Anderson Cooper because one of your cousins you know, was uh, detained by secret Syrian police. Like, can you give us some insight into what is really going on 
uh, in inside of Syria, in inside the borders, um, so that people really understand what uh, your cousin or anyone else has been going through? Sure. I mean, like Mary just said, it's really, even the civil war sometimes, like, you know, I, I know the media likes to label everything. The civil war concept still, like, you know, doesn't sit with me very well because it's really no. just a revolution what's happening. I mean, after you two years, of course, you might see some sectarians, you know, incidents here and there, but it is the full meaning of a revolution. Basically, it started with, with little kids chanting against the regime. The regime, you know, as any dictatorship government will just, you know, um, responded rudely to that, um, you know, uprising, and it started from there. Um, so the situation is really not a civil war. It's literally a government, a systematic killing machine that's, you know, attacking the people because they're rising against the dictator. Um, what's happening, you know, like, you hear in the news, it's, it's, it's absolutely horrific what's happening. Um, you know, my, my cousin was arrested uh, for, I believe, almost four weeks, uh, and he wasn't physically tortured because he is a high-profile activist. I, I think the regime kind of uh, didn't want the story to get out to the media and, like, you know, claim, you know, that he was tortured, but he saw other, other, uh, Activists being tortured, physically tortured, uh, but you know, beside the the physical torture, the physical torture that that he had been through, and his brother, who's younger than him, he's 20, 20 something years old, he's still actually in detention as we speak right now. We have no idea where he is. We have no idea if he's what kind of um, crime he committed. I and mean, they just arrest you. You have you just go and like. One of their basement, there are no rules or anything. Um, you know, there is no court thing that you know a government would do. Um, but the, the, to go back to the uh, mental torture that he was going through, a small room, like you know, the size of any regular room, um, w would hold 90, 90, 99 people in it. So you pretty much have a percentage of people actually dying every day just for suffocating. Like, there is no air in those cells that they stay in. Um, there is only one meal that they give them. Um, they are allowed to go to the bathroom only once a day. That's that's the rule. So, you know, I mean, there are tons of stuff that I can say, but I, I think you got the sense of what the situation there. So... I mean, how could you not rise up against this kind of government? How could you, you know, n not be an activist when, when, when this is happening and, and the world is just, you know, being okay with that or, you know, doing nothing about it or calling it civil war? I, I'm seriously, I, I get a little bit offended when somebody says it's a civil war or it's an, it, it is against human humanity what's happening, right. it's not just a civil war. And, and what I was going to say is, uh, you know, in terms of, like, the title of this room, uh, Civil War in Syria, I think primarily, like, we've had discussions regarding mm -hmm. Syria, um, but it, I think it's more of what, you know, I think the media probably uh, paints as the, you know, what it's what people can relate to, right? Um, I mean, although people would probably relate to, like, uh, revolution, mm -hmm. but just the fact that, like, there's no clarity on what's actually going on there uh, because people are just kind of, you know, painting whatever picture they would like and just kind of showing the gruesome photos and not actually digging into the to digging deep into the topic probably results in, you know, even like the confusion on my end, right? Like of not even knowing exactly how to label uh, this room. Uh, Mary, what what are your it's thoughts? Yeah, what what are your thoughts, Mary, on what, uh, you know, Reem has to say? Is all of this accurate from the, the research you've done? Absolutely, absolutely. And I can add to it that even before the revolution, uh, there was a systematic tendency to stifle any kind of dissent. People who wrote blogs, and I uh, have been a close friend of uh, Hassan Ghazawi for quite a few years, and I was looking back on some of my old emails, and I remember uh, campaigns that she had started, must have been uh, seven or eight years ago, to liberate bloggers, uh, people who had been arrested for just writing their own point of view about something. And when uh, he 
would ask what were some of the things that they were saying. There were things like uh, people should not uh, be prevented from uh, free assembly or people should be able to have um, a permit to open a business or people should not be arbitrarily arrested or things that are just so common. You know, it wasn't even, it wasn't anything like let's throw off the government. It was people being arrested for, for the most basic requests that they had made, just to make life normal and decent as we all considered life to be. And as a matter of fact, a, before the revolution as well, a friend of mine who's a Palestinian had a, come, he had passed through in Syria as part of an activist um, convoy, been arrested and put in the, in the prisons, and he came to visit me after all this, and yes, I saw men with no fingernails, I saw a um, person whose, um, whose back had been uh, slashed, and uh, he was framed by someone who just didn't, didn't like him, and this is how things happened. So, yeah. obviously, way before the revolution, uh, you had civil unrest, you had a, a way of living that was intolerable to any of us, any of us, none of us would accept this, this way of living. So naturally when people began protesting, they would consider it, you know, in, in our country, in Italy, the United States, if you go out, you know, you don't expect that you won't come back home, whereas in Syria, Everything that that Reem has said is absolutely true. That there, there's mass systematic disappearance of people. As a matter of fact, and this is very important, the the Syrian Arab Red Cross, Red Crescent, the, that takes care on a voluntarily, a voluntary basis, uh, both sides, you know, people who, who are in the in the opposition and people who are not in the opposition, they of the Red Crescent organization, so they have to be neutral. And many of them have disappeared, have been tortured, some of them have been killed. And these are, uh, these are people that are supposed to have protection. And the, the Syrian government has nothing to, to protect and to create environment that is safe. Right. Um, and I'm just, I'm just jotting down some things that I want to actually bring up uh, to each of you. Um, you know, in terms of in terms of Reem, you said you grew up in Syria. Um, what was the exact reason, let's say, you know, two years back now or a year and a half back when the peaceful protests first began? What exactly were those people protesting? Like now it's turned into a revolution, but before it turned into a revolution, what was the main reasons why Syrians uh, were protesting against uh, the Assad regime? Uh, so originally I'm from Dara, and if you know you've been following what's happening in Syria, it all started in a village southern Syria, southern from Damascus. It's called Dara. It's a very small city, and no one expected that it's going to start from there. But similar to any other places, young children wrote slogans against the regime on their, literally on their board in school. Um, and the reaction of the mayor of that town is to arrest those children who their ages ranged fra ranked from nine years old to years old. Oldest kids was 16 years old. They were arrested, they were tortured. And this is, I'm, I'm not telling you from somebody that I know, these kids are known because it's a small town, so everyone knows everyone. So I know some of those children actually personally. My, my family knows their family. So they were tortured and they were taken into Damascus, into you know, one of those basements, no one knew anything. So, you know, the, the families, the well-known families in the city decided to go to Damascus and march and try to release those kids, ask for the release of those kids. And of course, a lot of, you know, activists just, you know, uh, wanted to support them. So there were like 200 people who actually gathered in Damascus. This is, the, it wasn't even, the revolution wasn't even on, you know, the radar screen. This was literally a group of people who decided to go to Damascus and ask for the release of their children and their, you know, family members. Um, 
in the reaction of government in, in Damascus even was worse than because they started first in Dara and then they moved to Damascus and in Damascus literally and this is from a friend who was in that revolution that uh, protest they were told forget about those kids and you better have other kids because those kids you will never see them again this is literally the, the police officer or the chief of that you know jail would tell 200 people who are gathered to ask for children forget about them these kids are just forgotten you're not never gonna see them again so Yes. Go ahead, Mary. In addition to that, this they had written was the slogan. The slogan that they had written was a slogan that had been in the entire Arab world. Uh, the you know the people want the fall of the regime. So it wasn't as if they were um, doing something you know out of their own invention. They were uh, caught up in the zeitgeist of the, of the place, you know, of the, of the area of that time, uh, where. The people I can find it. It was necessary to, to go out onto the streets and, and to demand the basic uh, the basic democracy, the, to demand to, to vote, to demand to to live in a pluralistic and free society. And this is the thing that they weren't uh, they weren't doing anything that, that in other exactly. Places. I mean, these go ahead, go ahead, Reem. Reem, go ahead. These kids were, as I get out, they were influenced by what's happening. These kids were influenced by, by what was happening in Egypt. So they didn't come out of the flu. The government should have, you know, used their judgment and leadership to actually avoid having that. And if there were, like, children who did that, it, that's like, you know, for me, the common sense, you would release them and you would apologize because you know the whole area is on fire. And if you were really that, that you know, um, if Assad, as he uh, proclaimed that he's the, the, the person who's going to transfer Syria into the modern world, you would really act that way. That was absolutely stupid of, of those people who were in charge to say that. You could have absorbed this whole revolution by giving a little bit more right. And I'm not saying I think that's what I want, but at least to avoid the crisis. Because a lot of pro-regime say, well, you know... Uh, the revolution, the activists now, you know, this is, now the country is completely in a mess because of the acti activists and, you know, the revolution. No, it's because the government didn't know how to handle the situation. And, like Mary said, they first wanted the fall of the regime, but after the total reaction of the government, they wanted the regime, you know, to fall. They, they, were, not, they were only wanting releasing of those children. Now they, they want you know, to take Bashar Assad to, to prison. They want a lot more than what they asked for at, at the first, you know, uh, protest. In the, the right. Only, you know, a, a leadership who saw, you know, what's happening could have avoided that. Totally. Mary, did you have anything to follow up on? Otherwise, I would ask a uh, another question. But go ahead if you have something to follow up on. To me, you're asking? No, what she said is absolutely correct, that the, the, the people had asked for uh, reforms in the first place. Uh, the people, uh, as a matter of fact, the, the town the, uh, elders or whatever, who had gone to the authorities to ask for the release of the children, they had even said, we'll punish the boys for, for having uh, this graffiti. They even were willing to uh, to to agree that graffiti is bad and that these boys had done something that was not correct because the mindset was you don't do anything of your pro of your own initiative. You don't break any rules. There was a kind of a psychological terror uh, that was always in place. Uh, I've ne as I said, I've never lived in Syria. I don't have any Syrian relatives. But uh, I know I'm able to understand the, the kind of reign of terror that, that existed and now it's it's much more late and it's much more out there in your face but before there was uh, as I said if you wrote a blog they would they would imprison you you would disappear if you uh, if you did the, the smallest movement or some kind of free speech right against the, the only party that was allowed basically I mean 
there are a few other parties, secular parties, that have some some ability well, to, to and function. So Mary, you you bring up an interesting point that you know we've had some pro Assad individuals come onto Vonvo, which you know perhaps you know next time um, you know we can pair one of you up to really have a, an in depth discussion regarding you know what they actually stand for. But one thing that they one thing that they brought up in the past that the Assad regime you know uh, did very well in the country for decades was, you know, create this idea behind a, you know, a secular country, um, and, you know, they, they consider uh, themselves the only sec... Can I respond to that? Yeah, yeah, please, could you both respond can to I that? Respond where to where that are they first? coming, where <laughs> are they coming from with that? I has much more to say on the argument. Yeah. Uh, my, my point of view is that this uh, revolution, let's just call it a revolution today in this, in this chat later, it can be called a civil war if you like, but in this, just to make it easier for, for us, uh, this revolution um, was not was not um, a revolution for a Sharia government or for an Islamist government or for any kind of government. It was a revolution for human rights. It was a, a revolution for basic, normal way of living. The people did not, in the and they still to this day. If you look after two years of, of brutal um, repression of any kind of protest, in addition to two years of brutal war and a million refugees and a million and a half internally displaced, you will find that still today, it, local um, coordination committees of Syria are still calling for a pluralistic democracy. Now, pluralistic doesn't mean Sharia, but it doesn't mean secular either. The pluralistic means it's what people, the variety of people, uh, choose by their democratic or their, their popular consensus to, to have as, as their own system. It doesn't mean something imposed from them from above without their own senses given. Now, in one of your previous chats that I had listened to, one of your one of your participants said, and uh, I'm sure you heard it, um, that it was necessary for the Syrians to undergo a benevolent dictatorship. That this is something that was required for them in order to maintain secular Syria. Now, I ask, is secularism the ideal of secularism? More important than the ideal of freedom, is it possible, and I come, I live in any country that, that had undergone fascism, Italy, Italy has had, I'm hearing a return of what I'm saying. Right, I'm going to, I'm going to, do you hear a return as well? You were good before, one second, I'm going to make my volume, I think, a little lower, and on Reem's computer. Okay, go ahead. No, because uh, I live in a country that had undergone for 20 years a, a dictatorship that, that I would not even consider benevolent. Some people call it benevolent simply because we didn't have as many concentration camps as there were in the Nazi uh, regime. But there was no freedom of the press, exactly as in Syria. There was no freedom of assembly, exactly as in Bashar Assad, Syria. There was no a multiplicity of political parties. You couldn't work if you didn't belong to the fascist party, and so on and so forth. Exactly like in the Syrian benevolent dictatorship. Right. Now, I don't know any normal Italian that says we were better when we were living under fascism. I have met maybe one. And I think it was because for some reason, he uh, he gained something from it. Now, the only people that could enjoy a, a benevolent dictatorship, any kind of dictatorship, is someone who gains from it. And obviously, in this situation, there are many people that gain. And they are the, the let's say, official minority groups. So, in order for the minority, which should always be respected, and always is part of the pluralistic 
Syria and always has been and probably always will be, God willing. The, the, the groups of the minorities, uh, they, in order to, to be protected, it shouldn't be that they have special laws, that only they are the top brass, that only they can right. run the major companies, right. that only they... Yeah. So all of these things, if you, if you kind of analyze them, this is serious. This is the benevolent dictatorship that someone says is necessary to maintain secularism. Right. If this is what it is. Secularism, a value we we want to put on a pedestal. I don't know. This Great. So a question I ask also to Reem. Yeah, yeah. Reem, do you can you address uh, you know the secular concept and anything that Mary just brought up? Yeah, yeah. Do you can you address the the this secular state notion, which pro Assad people, you know, seem to uh, bring up, and you know any other points which Mary addressed? Um, now I don't want to repeat what Mary said, but she pretty much you know compared the situation. The notion that that the regime is secular is just ridiculous. I lived in Syria, and I tell you, it's not secular. It's it was a political party, a political game that Assad, the father, had played. Party were convinced that they were going to be safer under his leadership. The Alawite, like Mary said, they were benefiting. I'm not saying all of them, and I they see one of the questions where, like, you know, are we going to be worried about the minority if the revolution wins? Um, I mean, I have my best friends who I grew up with, they're all Christian, and they are now with the revolution fighting against this regime. If there's anybody with any common sense, they know they're in protect them not because they respect uh, their their rights or their freedom, they protected them to some extent because they wanted them to know, we are the one who are in charge, or we want you to be on our side, because, you know, the the Assad is uh, from the Alawi, which is a minority. So he wanted to surround himself by all the minority and the support of the minority. But that's just like people who lived in Syria, they know this is just a political game. He does not care about even Alawi. If he really cared about the Alawi sect, he wouldn't have got them into this trouble. I mean, now they are unfortunately in trouble because some people who are going to be irrational would go after Alawi because of what's happening. I mean, you have to understand what's happening. It's not, it's a genocide. If I see my family being killed, my children being tortured, I am not, I'm not going to guarantee what I'm going to do in the future. I hope I will still be civilized and I, I'm not going to be violent. But there's some people who will actually uh, go after revenge. The whole notion of the revolution, no. So you cannot judge the revolution by some incident that's going to happen. And this is, went through history. I mean, you know, all the revolution in Europe, here in the States, they all been in the same situation, you know, where you will see some revenge incident, but this is not the notion of the revolution. Right. But right. another thing about secularism, if, if I can if I can just add something, is that Libya, for example, is a completely um, Sunni uh, majority state. The, the minority is being 3 or 4% uh, non-Sunni. Non so uh, what the, what we what we have, you know, is um, a situation where after the after the war they had their elections, and what parties won? You would think the, the Islamist parties, not the secular parties won. The, the non-religious parties won basic governance of, of Libya, because when you have a, a country that isn't so uh, uh, unsure about its own identity. It doesn't impose, it doesn't have a, such a need to, to search for a, a, a religiously identified political movement because religion is part of life, the religion is part of the, the organization of the society. So then you look at Tunisia, right? Tunisia was far more secular than, than uh, any other country in North Africa. And the elections of Tunisia, who won? The, the so called Islamist parties. So it's, it's impossible to predict right. on the basis of the ethnic composition of a country who is going to emerge out of, a, out of an election. And 
uh, this is quite important, there has never been an election in Syria. There's never been any popular consensus given to put in power either a, a Bashar or his father Hafez. Never. So we're but talking about a dictatorship. <laughs> See, it is, it is a secular dictatorship, benevolent, if you want to call it benevolent. But it's right, go ahead, really Reen. not a democracy. Go ahead, Reen. Yeah, let me just point one thing. I mean, also in Syria, they set the bar, especially those pro-Assad people, they set the bar so low that you know, I, I've been in an argument with people who are pro-Assad. It's like, you know, at least we're not like Saudi Arabia where you have to wear a veil, you can't have the car. Yeah. Why would I compare myself to Saudi Arabia where I can't... Like, they set the bar for human rights so low that they're happy exactly. with the situation they are. But I don't want to be like that. And and if I'm not, you know, forced to wear a veil or I can drive a car in Syria, that means I have hum basic human rights. That's It's just a false argument. I mean, how could you just yeah. set the bar so low? Very good point. Right, it's a it's a very interesting point. So, uh, and I actually just took note of that. Um, so, what I was going to ask is, uh, you know, David has submitted a few questions. Um, you know, maybe I'll throw them out. Uh, you know, uh, let's see here. Uh, let's since you know, since we're on the secular subject, um, let's ask da let's ask David's question, which is: Assad has the support of the Alawites, the Druze, and the Christians actually all the minorities. Why do you think the Sunni majority will not take revenge on mi minorities? Can I uh, begin with that? Uh, yeah, sure, go ahead, yeah. Mary. <laughs> Just, I'll, I'll very brief. It's, um, he has the support of the Aluaks because uh, we, can, we can admit he's, uh, it's been pushed in that direction. You know, that, oh, hang on one second. I'm going to have to interrupt for a second. I have to let my dog be one, one second. That's okay. Go ahead, Reem. You, could, you can continue. Yeah, you can address that sure, question. I kind of, yeah, I kind of touched base on it uh, in my previous point. Uh, the, the Alawites are with him because they are benefiting, but again, don't forget that it's not, you know, 100%. I, again, I, ha I speak from a personal perspective. I have friends who are Christian, Druze, and Alawites, and they are all with the revolution. Yes, the majority of Alawites and Christian are with the regime because for 40 years he's been convincing them I'm the only one who is, pro who is protecting you. So, but right. Christianity existed in Syria way before Assad came. They were not persecuted. They were fine. And, they were and safe. as a matter of fact, in the, in the opposition there are Alawi brigades, there are Christian brigades, and uh, it's, it's the Druze, there are some, as a matter of fact, who had protested very, very vocally, and they had been um, attacked uh, in an extremely violent uh, way, almost, um, almost as if, how dare you? We've always defended you against uh, against the enemy, and they themselves know this isn't true. They laugh behind their hand and and carry on because caught actually in in the worse situation, I think, than others. Even though their region has has seen less bloodshed seen than less in the bloodshed. other regions. Right. Um, but it's not, it's not divided completely. The opposition is all Sunni, because it is, it's not that way at all. And about revenge, revenge is something, you know, that you, that you take after someone attacks you, someone does something terrible to you, you know? And the, the, it's, it's logical to expect. So what we have to do is we have to expect that there are going to be people who have been damaged extremely severely in this, in this uh, conflict, and they're going to have a need to, to, be, to, to have redress, to have some kind of answer to the situation. So what would be allowed to happen? Justice? That they see justice uh, for, for their, to, to cover the damages? Or that they take the, the feelings that they have in their own hands and it turns into revenge? That is up to the international community as far as I'm concerned. You, you can't expect the, the refugees to have the moral responsibility for what has befallen them. I, I don't put it on them uh, to, to, to have to bear that also on their, on their shoulders. I won't do it. I'm hoping that there's going to be a movement that, that is born, that is a justice movement, uh, that they will analyze every single situation from any side, wherever it's coming from. The documents are millions of documents. A visual audio that, that testify the, the events 
So bring all these up and let's seek justice. And then when that when that happens, I don't think that revenge is even going to be a topic, you know, unless we allow it. To be. Right. right. So, so what I, uh, what I wanted to ask next is actually, uh, you know, I wanted to maybe try and cover the whole idea behind the reb the rebels, and uh, I think one of David's questions might tie into that. And David writes. Like it was in Egypt, the Islamic movement is the strongest opposition group in Syria. Everywhere the Islamic Spring has overthrown the government, an Islamist regime has taken over. Aren't no. both of you being That's... naive? What safeguards will there be? So I guess, you know, if we want to tie, if you want to address that question, because... It's not, it's not accurate. That's not accurate, because uh, if you look at who won in Libya, Libya, it was a secular... <coughs> It's a secular president, it's a government. There's no Islamic government in Libya. So that was, you know, <laughs> I don't know. I, I've never even heard of Islamic Spring. I've heard of Arab Spring. But Islamic Spring is something I've never, I've never heard of that. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, you know, I think, I don't know where David comes from. And, uh, and just as I imagine he's not Syrian as I am not Syrian. And that would mean that whatever the outcome, when it comes to a moment of decision, how to bring forward the, the, the situation, the post-asset, because there is going to be a post-asset. Whether or not it's going to take a year or two or eight or ten, it's going to be a post-asset period. There, there always is an end to every, to every leader. It doesn't right. ever go on forever. So after that, the end of that, there's going to be a, a different phase. The phase is going to be, we, we all are hoping, not um, an imposed uh, peacekeeping uh, protectorate. It might be that, but it might also be that some kind of elections are, are devised. And if there are elections, you know, it's up to the Syrians and the Syrians alone to do they want. So for someone to be overly concerned about this, I think it's almost, you know, it's almost like it's none of our business. Let them choose who they want to choose. Right. Uh, you know, Reem, do you have a comment regarding that? Oh wait, Reem, I don't, I don't hear you. What? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Not uh, here, I've been hearing this a lot, you know, especially here in the state that you have Islamic phobia, and uh, what if you know the Islamic get a thumb? and hijack your illusion, what's going to happen. You know, there is a major difference in Egypt that Brotherhood uh, Party was always very organized. That they've been there forever. So it, it, I, I wasn't very surprised that it, it happened in Egypt. Now the Brotherhood uh, Party is ruling, but I still have faith in Egypt. They, ro they rose against Mubarak because they wanted their freedom and they wanted equality for everyone. They will rose against, they will rise against um, any government that's not, and I already have Egyptian friends who are already re continuing the revolution. I'm not going to stop yeah, until they get true. all the rights. Right. Um, in Syria, you know, bear in mind that the Muslim Brotherhood, they don't have the same organization. There is a Brotherhood, you know, party in Syria, but it's not very organized. They're, they're not as well established as in Egypt. Plus, Re even if they are, we go back to the same point. We rose against any dictatorship. If they want to put whoever, even if an Alawi president comes tomorrow and he's going to rule by the law, I will vote for him. I, I could care less what kind of religion he's from or what kind of sex he's from. Christian, Sunni, if he's going to rule by the laws and enforce those laws on everybody, not only on you know specific sects rather than other, I'm going to vote for him. And the, that's what the Syrian people want. But so so my question is, is my question is though is uh. You know, do new laws need to be totally, you know, put in place? Like the laws that currently exist, you know, are those not going to work long term? And they have to be totally revamped. Sure. And then the other thing I was going to, the other thing I was going to ask uh, to you, Reem, was um, sure. what laws are there other than obedience? Uh, you know, I, I, I'll leave that. Um, you know, for, you can just, you know, for you to both answer. But I guess the other thing that I was just curious about was, you know, I've heard um, from other speakers, you know, that. You know, you're saying that the Muslim Brotherhood in Syria isn't, um, let's say, that organized, but I've heard that they are far more radical 
than the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. So would it scare you that if those people are some of the people who are, you know, rebels and fighting against Assad, that if they were to return, if they were to be put in power, that, you know, that would seriously, you know, uh, you know, scare you? Um, let me just answer you on that point and then I'll go back to the laws. Of course it scares me, but does it stop me? It's not going to stop me. I will be scared if somebody who's extremely extremist come into power and they don't want to you know, follow the laws and, and they want to enforce their own laws. Uh, but is it going to stop me from wanting my freedom, from wanting Syria to be a, a true sectarian country for rights for everyone, regardless their background, regardless their religion? It's not going to stop me. I will rise against them, and I bet you all the Syrian people will rise against any dictatorship who would come if they want to, uh, you know, pretend they're sectarian like Assad, but they're actual dictatorship, or if somebody who's upfront extremist, Islamist, and want, you know, to uh, to have Shia laws, you know, cover Syria, we will rise against them. Now, the laws, actually, you'll be surprised. If you read the uh, constitution of the Syrian um, government, they're, they're actually fantastic laws, but are they enforced? No, they're not. They're only on paper, no one follows them. And when Assad the son came into power after his dad, they changed the constitution in 15 minutes to change actually the age of the president to be less than 40. I think it was set at 40 years old and he was like 36. 35. They changed it in 15 minutes. So the problem are not in the laws, it's have to enforce the laws and to respect those laws and, and have them re be enforced on everyone, regardless what their status, who they do they know, if they have a connection, if they're from that sect or other sect. Right. But another about the, the constituent phase, you know, of a post-war, there's always a phase where you have to develop a constitution, you have to rise up from, from zero, let's say. So the constituent phase is, is almost always um, a coalition of, of people to, to write it. It's never one political force, unless one political force has been in the opposition, and this is certainly not the case of Syria. Syria has an, an extremely great opposition, and uh, I, I find even the, the fact of the, of the transitional government, the first time it was um, a Kurd, the second time it was uh, um, an Alawi, a Christian, no, I'm sorry, the Laoi, a Christian. But there are Alawi, there are, I mean, the, the, the diversity of the council is, is much more than the diversity of anyone that's ever ruled in, in Syria in modern times. So so the fact of uh, wondering, you know, oh, they're zomp, they're going to you know, throw this, you know, Sharia law on you, it's, it's like a, you know, a boy who calls wolf. You know, you're just... They're expecting it, and they want it to become a self-fulfilling prophe prophecy. Those who oppose it, those who actually would could implement it, aren't even interested in implementing it because they're much more pluralistic. And to go back to the, to the Muslim Brotherhood, if you read the document that they had issued, I think it was about a year ago. I don't have it under my under under hands right now. But this document was one of the most uh, pluralistic kind of documents that, that I think I'd, I'd even ever seen. It, it was even more pluralistic than what, than what you get in Italy, you know? And, uh, and it, I was thinking, but well, they don't do this because, you know, to get votes because there's no voting. The, the Muslim brother doesn't exist in, in Syria. They, they, they only exist outside of Syria. Right. And, they, and, the ex and this is something that's kind of important, the exile. Syrian community is, is very important, you right. know, because they have, uh, it's not that they just remember, you know, it's not like they want to bring back the Muslim Brotherhood, although some people, of course, want to, but they've lived in, in various countries, in various democracies, and they, they want to bring back to their, to their country the, the experiences and the the new traditions that they've acquired, and I think this is going to be an enrichment for, for Syria, and not not something that's new. Right. Uh, Reem, did you have anything to follow up on, or do you want me to ask my next question? No, you can go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Uh, sorry. Uh, so what I was going to ask um, is a lot of attention, you know, and I, by the way, in a, in a little bit I'll want to kind of move towards, um, you know, different solutions here, but... Um, what I was going to ask is, 
you hear a lot about the rebels uh, who are inside of Syria right now, and there are a lot of you know reports saying that uh, so many of these people aren't even actual you know Syrian civilians. They're from other countries inside of Syria, just fighting to fight. Um, there's a lot of reports going around saying that it's a lot of these rebels who are doing a lot of the killings of civilians and participating in this genocide. I mean, like, do you think that there's a there's a legitimate argument to be made that part of the reason why this topic, you know, can get so confusing confusing is because it's not literally just you know one group versus versus the regime, but rather like you've got people from Turkey and Lebanon, let's say, and Jordan and just other places like participating in like just uh, a war that could go on for, you know, years with if, no definition. If I may, if, if I may first, before talking about, about the rebels, I, I would like to talk about the much more well-documented foreign presence in Syria, and that is the, the arms from Russia, many, many arms, which... Uh, if you if you look at any kind of shells that that uh, that are the debris you find, it's got Russian Cyrillic writing on it. So the the Assad the side, the, the regime side, the government side is being sustained economically and militarily by a gigantic force. They're being sustained by a Hezbollah. They're being sustained uh, morally by Hezbollah and. Uh, also with, with soldiers that have been soldiers that have been brought back to Lebanon dead. Uh, Iran has had persons there have been 38 that have been captured who said we are pilgrims on a, on a mission you know on a, on a, pra on a prayer um, pilgrimage but they were, they were not near any site of any kind of uh, pilgrimage and uh, all of that the revolutionary guard ID card you know it would be like as if, you know, G.I. Joe of America, you know, got, got stopped in, in, in Iraq. So, talking about the rebels having Turkish people and uh, this person and that other person, you know, obviously, part of this group, because we all do know Syrian people who have gone back yeah, to fight. We all have heard of um, people from Libya who have gone. We've all heard of people from... Egypt who have gone, there have been people who have gone to, to assist in the in the revolution. That's not it's not untrue. But the majority, the more um, aggressive relic force is obviously on the other side. And why is that not really the topic of discussion since it's far more evident and in our and in your face, you know? That's <laughs> just something I have to say before you go into any kind of rebel analysis. Right. Uh, Reem, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree with Mary uh, 100%. I mean, we hear all about the rebels who are coming and fighting and killing, you know, from other countries. How about the systematic army that's coming from Iran or like the, you know, financial uh, support that's coming from Russia or China and like Mary said, Hezbollah. I mean, this is, we're talking about hundreds of you know, soldiers who are coming to help the rich team against their own people. If there's, and you have to understand, you know, the ge geographic of Syria in the middle, you know, of the Middle East. There, for example, because I'm, I'm from Bera, which is the border of, uh, with uh, Jordan, there are a lot of family who actually split. Like there is one family in Jordan, another family lives in Bera. So there are a lot of connections, especially on the borders between those two families. So if, you know, I have a cousin who lives in, in, in Jordan. It's going to probably want to cross the border and come to Syria and try to help. But this is not, this is just the emotional reaction of people helping. It's not the systematic help that the regime is getting against their own people. So, so do you think, so you, you honestly think, and I mean, I just want to get clarity on this because it's the first time someone would be bringing it up. You, you know, do truly believe that not only, let's say, our weapons being, you know, funneled into the Syrian uh, regime to fight against uh, rebels and other Syrian civilians, but it's also, you know, soldiers, did I, did people, I, people well, as well. There's, there's, this is the there's fact, vast evidence. 
yeah, this is a fact. It's not just what I believe. This is a fact that there is people who were captured. They're from Iran. They couldn't speak Arabic, and they they were they had the military IDs, like Mary said. Same thing for Hezbollah. They, they actually the my cousin was released because of the transaction happened between the regime and the rebels, and they released the rebels released uh, hundreds the of Iranians. Soldiers, the Iranian soldier. So this is a fact. It's not what I think. So so just can you just clear it up though because it's a little just so. Basically, uh, is is Iran, you know, purposefully sending in people to fight for pro Assad regime, or you're saying people are being captured and then they're being like kind of brainwashed to fight for the pro Assad regime? Like Iran, yeah. Iran is ex going. <laughs> you know better than I do. Uh, Iran is sending actually soldiers on the ground to help the regime. Okay. And then it happened when they're on the front line, sometimes they get captured by the rebels, and that's when they traded them with some of the rebels' uh, prisoners. Okay, got it. There could also be a few uh, kind of say, loose cannons that go in on, on, the, on their own and say, I'm going to fight. But it's, it's basically an organized thing because they are official allies, they are official... Um, you know, it's not anything hidden. It's not like they have to pretend. You know, it's uh, it's all very in the open and uh, and the public. The only thing is, it's kind of you know, it makes it a little bit difficult for them when uh, when they tell their their soldiers you have to pretend you're a pilgrim, and then you find out you know that it's, they're really there you know to 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 do military operations. So obviously, you know the the. Iranian, the Iranians that, that have been captured have all been soldiers with, I think, very few exceptions. <laughs> right. Uh, so, I mean, I, I do know that, uh, let's see, um, David posted a question. I see a question about the Iranian yeah, revolution. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I see. Uh, da, 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 da. So That's he totally wrote... totally different situation. It, yeah, I'm just looking. Between the creation of Syria and the Ba'athists, there's a coup after coup of calling, all calling themselves revolution. Uh, then he writes, isn't that exactly what was said in Iran? All the moderate supported Khomeini, where are they now? Do you know what he's referring to, either of you? Well, a revolution, a revolution is, is a, a neutral term. You know, it's not, there's not like an Islamic revolution and a capitalist revolution and a communist revolution. A revolution means... A, a, popular movement, you know, that, that aims to remove the, the, the system that's, that's in power and to replace it with a different one, you know. There's the industrial revolution, the cultural revolution, and on and on and on. So um, the, the Iranian revolution was, this was a revolution against the Shah. It was a completely, you know, he, uh, the Shah was, um, was extremely violent and vicious against his people. And when the when the Iranian revolution began, it was exactly like I mean the Iranian revolutionaries would have been with the opposition to Assad to, in these days because their claims were exactly the same. They had been massacred. They had been denied their basic human rights. They had been detained and disappeared in in, in terrible torture dungeons, what have you. So. Uh, it, it's what comes after a revolution that defines what the revolution was, you know. In the moment that it's happening, it's dynamic. You know, you, you have, you know, if a little child, you know, I don't like it. He doesn't exactly know what he wants after it because he, he doesn't have the experience. If, if a country has never e experienced democracy or, the, or freedom, you know, they, they see it, you know, they see an idea of it. This is what their aim is. But really, what, what they first trying to do is to, to throw off the chains. So the, the first task of a revolution is to is to throw off who is oppressing you, to, to change that. So you know, it, it pre it, it's a condition you know before any kind of a dictatorship or whoever coming in, into power is determining. Because in the moment of the revolution, as, as I said, we've got you know, it's got an opposition that is so you know tetric. Tetra, it's got so many, you know, uh, bodies to it. You know, you've got the not only it's not only the, the Sunni, not an Islamic 
revolution by any means. It's, it's a people's popular revolution. Great. Um, so I guess, you know, I, I, I have one other uh, question that I'd really like to, you know, dive into solutions. Um, you know, Reem, what's your thoughts on basically how the media is portraying uh, this conflict this civil war, genocide, revolution, um, you know, the fact that this is, you know, different from Egypt, which seemed to, like, you know, end, and now it's kind of Egypt having its own problems now, uh, different from, like, the way Libya was covered. Like, now we have Syria, which, you know, is in the news uh, here or there. It's, I don't feel like it's it gets direct attention every day. But what's your opinion on, you know, uh, how the media's coverage of this, uh, you know, story uh, seems to be, um, and, you know, what people really need to know uh, about what's going on there, and how do you think, like, uh, a platform like Vonvo can help in, um, you know, really uh, communicating what's the, the truth about what's actually going on there? Um, so, the media, it's always, you know, um, it, it looks for events that's exciting, because it's news. Uh, in terms of what's happening in Syria, I think the coverage is it's poor. It has been poor. Uh, I mean, they're, they're great coverage here and there, but it's not, you know... Uh, I mean, there's people who are dying, like 200 people dying every single day, but you don't hear about it every day. You only hear about it, you know, once once a week, if, if you're lucky on end or something. Uh, I'm, I'm not surprised with this coverage. This has been happening over and over around the world. The free world countries, they, you know, it's easier for them to say this is a, an, a, you know, an inside conflict. It's a civil. We're not gonna interfere. Then actually do something about it because it's complicated. When they actually go in and try to take sides, the it, politics is, is dirty, and they don't want to get their hands dirty. And you know, if you look at the United States now, they have plenty on their plate. They have the economy issues. They have plenty, and they're not interested. No one has the appetite to actually go in Syria and actually try to issue. So I'm not counting on, you know, the media in general. I'm not counting on, you know, what the free world is going to do in Syria. But what I sometimes I'm disappointed with is like, well, at least if you don't want to help, don't stand against. Like, don't issue, you, you know, the Assad, you know, without the support, the international support, he wouldn't have lasted that long. If, if Russia wasn't, you know giving weapons to the Syrian regime, if Iran was giving the financial aid and the money that it's giving to, it would have collapsed by now. Economically, it would have collapsed by now. So, you know, I'm not expecting the states to go in and have, you know, soldiers on the ground and help or like have a no-fly zone, which could have actually avoided this whole mess, but I'm not expecting it because even the Syrian people don't want to have to, you know, somebody else to pay their bill. They want to fight this regime on their own. It, I think that the support that the regime is getting from the outside countries, that's what really sustaining and making, you know, the, the regime uh, more powerful than, than the rebels. Um, now, I am all for raising awareness because I still, to this day, which is very disappointing, I run, I run into people and they don't even know what's happening in Syria. So for me, raising awareness Letting people know what's happening in Syria is my, you know, number one priority. Uh, raising, you know, funds and, and trying to help in terms of humanitarian aid, it's my number one priority. And I thank you for having this conversation because, you know, sometimes I touch one person, you know, and, and they make a difference in their own community and it's worth it. So uh, I, right. I just work on, you know, personal level. I'm not expecting the world to hear me, but if I, you know, can get in person and they can get to their community that's helpful right and you just got you, your ranking just went up from one to two so you just you just got someone there <laughs> yeah we're now going to go to three let's see i have to tell you i, I can't I, vote more than one three so. boom <laughs> there we go <laughs> yeah. i i couldn't uh, you know promote this nice. uh, because i am i live in uh, uh in new york area so it's we had this like storm and we had some issues so I even lost power for a while so like oh, I, wow. I couldn't really you know get people to hear it but people were asking if they can watch it online afterwards and I said we'll have the link so hopefully more people will tune in and we'll, we'll get you know 
yeah. to raise awareness among Yeah, yeah, that I that's so that's you know, it, thankfully you were able to actually, you know, join because if you lost power that would have messed things up. Um you know, Mary, what is uh your take on how the you know media cover covers this media. uh you know this topic and I guess what 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 Reem said, I'm, I'm in agreement with, although I have something to add, uh, which is my own small extreme disappointment, is the alternative media, I think, has been woefully terrible <laughs> on this issue. They, um, at first, were very supportive of certain, um, certain revolutions, certain... Uh, people's uh, protests to, to what is objectively um, a lack of, of individual uh, freedom of expression, which is what, what had happened in, in the other revolutions, the, the many other revolutions. And at a certain point, they decided there's a good revolution and there's a bad revolution. Um, the, the Bahrain revolution is okay. Um, we, I'm talking about the alternative media. The Libyan revolution was no good because... For some reason, um, ideologically, we can't uh, we can't back these people because they asked for help from outside, you know. Um, and this outside help was was the, the, the Arab League had decided to, to ask NATO to institute a no-fly zone, and we all know that it turned into a, a, an attack. But it brought about the, the conclusion of the revolution. So. <laughs> Uh, if we're looking about the conclusion, you know, it was a successful, um, a successful endeavor, let's say. But the alternative media, we just said that, you know, the NATO, you know, I'm not, I don't support all NATO actions. In fact, I don't think I've ever supported a NATO action in my life until the, the Libya intervention. So the, the, the NATO is bad. So obviously, this revolution is bad. And then they decide, uh, okay, uh, uh, they, a certain a certain regime is uh, is acceptable because they've always had a position that, that ideologically we agree with, and so on and so forth. So the alternative media, instead of looking at it at the, at the evidence, and I'm talking about volumes, videos, millions of videos, and I don't know how people can deny, you know, what what is in the first they wanted, you know. Um, journalists to come in there and then journalists aren't allowed in okay so journalists are getting killed the ones that are there but the ones you know the Syrian the regime doesn't allow uh, uh, journalists to cover you know the, the, the war so independent journalists come in and the independent journalists you know uh, they are the ones that are paid by the Assad uh, regime and then there's other people so the ones that are paid by the Assad regime the alternative media says well the they're okay. They're good. You know. So I find this kind of. Um, I'm extremely disappointed in the the, the the ideological war. You know, that's been that's been born when you take. You know, if, if any of these situations were happening in New York. You know, I mean, we remember in the oh, in Los Angeles or Berkeley, someone had pepper sprayed into their eyes. I mean, they would hue and cry for for weeks on end. You know. And much, much more is happening in Syria, and people are are quiet about it. You know, why? Or oh, because they're Syrians. You know, Americans are more important. Or West, you know, if you're if you're a Westerner, you know, it's, it's something that touches you. you know? right. So my, I, I think that that what what Reem said about the mass media, that the, the mainstream mass media is true. You know, they have kind of wanted to you know keep their hands out, you know, show one side and the other side, and they always say, well, these reports haven't been documented. We don't have, you know, um, we don't have a secondary verification that these documents are authentic, you know. So, I don't know. I mean, they, they put the, the, a witness up to a certain scrutiny that, that normally they wouldn't be subjected to. I mean, they certainly don't subject the, the regime to that kind of scrutiny. So, I think, you know, as far as the, the alternative media, that's also been very disappointing. As far as vulnerable goes, I think it's a really a, a good platform. A, I like the fact that people can express themselves. You're, you're a very good moderator that allows us to kind of carry on <laughs> as, as long as as long as we like to. 
and uh, mm. and I'm I'm, po I'm positive that it's uh, it's kind of a, a system that that people will like once they once they find out of it. here in Italy. You know, I'm going to have to publicize it a bit. Uh, we have the kind of the limit that Italians don't speak that, that much English. <laughs> But if you start doing Italian debates, <laughs> we'll, yeah. we'll have a lot more uh, <laughs> bon <-bo laughs> Italian views. Great. So why don't we just, just because in uh, 15 minutes, uh, I'm getting another discussion started regarding Israel-Palestine, which both of you are more than welcome to you know, tune in, watch, speak in, actually, because we just had a cancellation um, by one of the speakers. But... All in all, I mean, what what are your what are your solutions, Reem, going forward? I mean, we can, you know, take a look at this more in depth, you know, next time. But I mean, if you want to hint at what you think really needs to go on uh, right now in Syria, and then Mary, you could go ahead after. I'm sorry, you want me to go first? Yeah, yeah, yep. Oh uh, sure. Um, I mean, I don't think there is a. a a magic solution for what's happening and the, the thing that people don't understand the more the revolution has it's going to be more messy if, if this revolution ended you know in, in three months in the beginning three months i guarantee you syria is going to be in a way better place than now now it's messier people some people will will take revenge so the after i'm not too concerned like mary said about the regime falling assad will fall i mean this is like history the dictatorship don't last. He will fall at some point. The thing is, after he falls, how many people he's going to take down with him? Is he going to take the whole country? We hope not. I mean, he's pretty much, you know, destroying the whole country. Definitely. So the, the rebuilding process is going to be very, very hard. And you know, one of the opposition leaders who recently made the news about his proposal, he wanted to start a dialogue. I think this, at some point, it's going to start. It's going to start, you know, people sitting down from both sides, but. Not with Assad, not with anybody from his, you know, surrounding the, his mafia, as I call it, who actually was participated in killing the Syrian people. But there's some people who are still in the government um, who are probably under house arrest. They're, they're still, they haven't defected, but I don't think they have the ability to defect. But they haven't part been participating in killing uh, other people. I think at some point the discussion is going to be with them on how to move on, and it's going to be messy for a while. I, I don't promise anyone it's going to be, you know, the pink road to freedom. It's going to be messy, but then eventually it's going to be better than what we have. And I see, I know it's, it's not related, but some of David's question were like, you know, he's bringing Iran a lot, and like, why is it not going to be the same? It, maybe the revolution is going to be hijacked. Of course, we don't know. but. Is that enough reason for us to just sit down and say, we don't know what's going to be next, so let's not start anything. You have to keep going to know what's going to be next. And I think the discussion with the people who did not physically kill other Syrians, that's where it's going to start. Great. And Mary? Well, I don't I don't really have a... I, I agree in, in a large way with, with what Reem has said, but I don't really... A, have an idea of how it's going to end, because simply for the, the fact that I see that the, the, the main the, the main benefit in the Middle East, and I'm not only talking about Syria, I'm talking about Palestine, Israel, has been to maintain instability. As long as there is conflict, instability, um, mass, the outside forces outside countries have a piece of uh, the say of what happens. So the farther away things are from resolution, the more the rest of the world likes it. So I don't see the rest of the world basically coming in and being, haven't shown concern thus far, you know. Um, as Reem said, you know, they could have done something a while ago. They could have implemented a simple no-fly zone, which doesn't mean coming in bomb. It means but you can't bomb from above if you have planes. And, and, and the fact is this war has been the war basically because the Assad has the Air Force. You know, they've been doing the, the bulk of the, of the damage. So the thing is, I don't, I don't know if there's really going to be uh, any kind of solution because there's always going to be 
some kind of uh, uh, dynamic in the area that insists to maintain instability. Instability is attractive to, to the outside. So if there's going to be, a, there will be, you know, inclusion, you know, Assad will fall, it will end. The, there's going to be an aftermath of the war. There's going to be refugees probably living outside of their country for decades, as we've seen in Israel. People have, who live in what is now Israel are outside of it, in, in uh, Lebanon, Jordan, and in Syria. And it's, they've been there for 40 years. So it's not like, you know, that the, the Syrian refugees are going to have an immediate return to home either. So I don't, I don't really know. I mean, I'm, I'm not a political scientist, so I don't, I don't have... Uh, a true vision of, of what's going to happen. I, I basically see it that to be a continuation pad, but in a in a degree where people at least that the world has, has become aware of what has been happening in Syria for decades. And now the Syrian people are going to be more empowered to do do something mm -hmm. to to rule themselves instead of to be ruled by a, by a family. So I don't know. I I say the road ahead is it's going to be extremely long and probably a, it's going to involve not only a, the neighboring countries, but it's going to be a, a compulsion to maintain instability permanently. So I see. Right. All right. Um, what I was going to say is uh, Raphael, um, he posted a question at the bottom of the text chat. Um, I am actually, you know, unfortunately I just have, I have to step out because we have another discussion taking place and I only have one computer and one recording tool to do the recordings on okay. and I'm only one person. So what I was going to say is if you'd like to address Raphael's question, which says, what's the opposition in Syria's view on its neighbors, such as Iran, Russia, and Israel? Um, you know, that would be great if you want to address that for him. Uh, if you if both of you want to continue your discussion further and you know ask one another any questions, that would be awesome. Um, and you know I just wanted to thank you right now, just before I run, uh, for uh, you know both of your time. I thought you guys did an amazing job, and that was you know awesome to listen to. Thanks, <laughs> Max. All right, thank you. I'll be in touch with both of you very soon. And Raphael, how oh. are you doing? <laughs> Fine. All right, so Raphael, I'll leave um, it. I just have a good day, guys. Go ahead. All right, bye. You too.